Well, our text tonight is in Luke chapter 6, verse 21, where Jesus said, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. The other side of the coin, as it were, is in verse 25, in the first part of the verse, where Jesus said, But woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. One of the most abiding images in my mind when I think of Loki Chokyo in Kenya, a town I visited often with the Middle East Reform Fellowship teaching there, teaching pastors and prospective pastors from Sudan, South Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania. But it's of a little girl, perhaps 10 years old. I was out one day with one of the students out of the compound walking around this 10-year-old girl, and picking up, she was picking up red earth dust almost from the ground and putting it into her mouth. I will never forget it. I turned to my student and said, what is happening? What is she doing? Oh, he said, she is so hungry, she's putting something, anything, into her stomach. I was able to take that little girl and the families and we had a provision where food was being prepared for us in, in a compound there in Loki Chokyo. But what was not eaten was given to hungry people. Some of them, like this little girl, starving people. And probably most of us have never eaten food left over by others. But in much of the world today, hunger is still a, a reality. That little girl was starving. She was so hungry. She was willing to put earth into her mouth, get something into her stomach. Well, hunger was a bane in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a vast underclass called the poor who would consider themselves blessed if they had a, a good meal once in a while. And there were Jerusalem beggars on the street corners who would cry out to passers-by for spare coins in order to live. So there were people where hunger threatened their existence. If that ache of hunger was unsatisfied, they would starve, perhaps die. And for many poor people, there was a fine line between hunger and starvation, as there still is in some parts of the world. So when the Lord Jesus Christ said, blessed are you who hunger now, he wasn't saying that there's a blessedness in our bodies when we are painfully aching for food, hungry, starving. How idiotic and cruel it would have been for me to have turned to that starving Turkana child in Loki Chokyo and said to her, Blessed are you who hunger now. She would have quoted back to me perhaps the words of James. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So the Lord Jesus Christ commended his people for responding to the hunger of fellow believers with physical food. Jesus said when we do that, it's as if we're giving food to him. But here what Jesus has in mind is not so much physical hunger for physical food. The Lord Jesus is emphasizing something else, but using that hunger as an, ex as an illustration. Now, he was, of course, truly concerned about physical hunger for food. Luke will tell us about that in chapter 9, when there was an occasion when there was a vast multitude, including 5,000 men, plus women and children. So upwards of 5,000, 10, 12,000 perhaps, fainting for lack of food. And the Lord Jesus Christ multiplied five loaves and two fish and fed them all abundantly. But in this beatitude, the Lord Jesus Christ is employing a metaphor, a picture. He's emphasizing a hunger for God, hunger for spiritual things, hunger for righteousness, hunger for salvation. The blessed man or woman is the one who is hungry for God, are you hungry for God, hungry for Jesus this evening? 
So the Lord Jesus is again opening up themes here which we find in the Old Testament. For example, Psalm 34, verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Or Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Thomas Watson says about that verse, If a friend invites guests to his table, he doesn't expect them to bring money for their dinner. But only that they come with appetite. Do you have an appetite for God? A hunger for God? Here's that apostolic hunger expressed by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 8 to 11. Are you hungry for God? Hungry for Jesus? Listen to Paul. Philippians 3 verse 8. I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. See, Paul is hungry that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. There's the Apostle Paul longing for Jesus. So we think of the time when we were hungriest and combine that feeling to understand the metaphor, the picture that Jesus is using here. Those who hunger for righteousness, hunger for God, have a desperate longing for God. They don't excuse or belittle their sins. They don't just ignore them. Don't sweep them under the carpet. They repent honestly, genuinely, thoroughly, without excuse. They refuse junk food Christianity and the artificial tasteless flavours of a godless culture. They are hungry to be right with God, so they depend on Jesus Christ and want to feed on him as their daily bread, like manna from heaven. You know the hymn that says, feed me till I want no more. That's not talking about sport. That's talking about a hunger for God. They hunger for a time with Jesus, knowing that he alone can satisfy the soul. So I'm asking tonight, are you hungry for Jesus? If you're hungry for Jesus, then you will be satisfied. You will be filled, renewed, refreshed, strengthened. So let's think first of all tonight about unsatisfied hunger. Many people are hungering and thirsting. They are dissatisfied with materialism. Their souls are empty and they're seeking to fill them, seeking to give themselves to something. Perhaps they have a hobby and they give themselves to it. They want to fill the soul with something. When we lived in Sheffield, there was a couple who lived across the road from us. They were great neighbours. But nearly every evening we would see them, they would sit side by side in an upstairs window. The husband was on his computer, his wife was next to him on her computer. They would sit side by side, spending hour after hour researching their ancestry. That was their hobby. Researching the family tree, going back hundreds of years. They would subscribe to specialist websites. They would trawl through thousands of records on a computer looking for a particular named relative. This was their hobby. All their spare time was dedicated to this. I can picture them they're sitting there now in my mind's eye, night after night. And we appreciate people can't survive only by eating and drinking. Not just as the animals do. People have a soul. They know there's more to life than food. And that hunger will show itself then. In all sorts of ways. A fascination with the family tree. Or steam trains. Or gardens. Or stamp collecting. 
or military history, or vintage cars, or works of art, or chess, or computer games, or sport, or whatever it is. There's an endless list. But the world is full of people who are dedicated to their special interest. And they spend time and money. And for such men and women, there's nothing odd or antisocial in the particular ways that they satisfy their hunger. In fact, they find it very hard to understand when your indifference to their special hobby, they can't work it out. Why aren't you interested too? They've discovered a meaning to life. They're hungering after this interest, this hobby. Now, if we're going to spend our time and our energy pursuing an interest, I want us to think tonight and ask some questions. Asking some key questions. Because the Word of God gives us a criteria tonight about what we should really be hungry for. So let's ask some questions to test the things of the world. What are you hungry for? Let's ask, will the things you hunger after last? Will they last? The durability. Because God has given each of us an immortal, never-dying soul. Every human birth is the beginning of an endless existence. So the Lord Jesus Christ says, when you choose the things you're going to hunger after, have you thought about your never dying soul? So the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of certain people who possessed very valuable objects, but moth and rust were corrupting them. Thieves were stealing them. Now, what they were pursuing, the objects they were pursuing, their interests, their hobby, those things were tremendously attractive, but they didn't pass the test of durability. What is the passing of the years going to do such, to such things? What would be about, what about the march of history and time? The social changes we are seeing all around us. Or a robber could take off with them. A flood could ruin them. A fire could destroy them. All your hunger could be focused on something that can easily be lost. On the 20th of November 1992, a fire broke out in Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle, the largest inhabited castle in the world. One of the official residences of the Queen. And the castle suffered extensive damage, was fully repaired over subsequent years at a cost of £36.5 million. But what if your interest was you must possess a certain work of art? You give your right arm to have that work of art. One of the items lost in the royal collection was a, a Sir William Beachy equestrian portrait of George III and the Prince of Wales reviewing the troops. It was 13 feet by 16 feet. And because it was so big, they couldn't remove it in time before the flames engulfed Windsor Castle. And Peter Brook, who was then Secretary of State for National Heritage, said the loss of the painting in the fire was a national disaster. See, if your life is focused on a painting, say, or whatever it is, something that, is going, that can be destroyed, destroyed in a day, how perilous it is. And even if that something survives, moth and rust, fire and flood, the march of time, the onset of age, economic change, what about the last change? The last great change. What about the world to come? What about the judgment before God? Can neither life nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, separate you from them? So we're confronted with this great question then. What are you going to give yourself to tonight? Perishable things? Or the greatest treasure? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. So, 
any thinking, any intelligent man or woman will ask the question, will the things I'm hungering after last? You have a never dying soul. Are you hungering for lasting treasure? See, there's a hymn that says, Solid joys and lasting treasure. None but Zion's children know. Will the things you hunger after last? Well, let's ask another question. Will the things you hunger after answer when you call on them? Think of that test that Elijah brought to the the gods of Canaan in that Old Old Testament confrontation of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And Elijah told the the priests of Baal, to cry out to their so-called God. And how the priests of Baal cried out. In my mind, I picture it's almost like a heavy metal rock concert. There they were, banging their heads and cutting their arms and crying out. Bringing all the pressure they could on their so-called God. And they begged for some evidence that Baal was there. The bail would see, the bail would hear, the bail would answer, the bail would un- understand, and nothing, no answer. They hungered for something that was not able to answer. Something that gave no indication at all that their idle delusion was anything else than a, d- a delusion, unresponsive. Dead, not able to see, not able to hear, not able to answer at all. All they heard was the echo of their own voices and the mockery of Elijah. So if your great obsession is making money, does your wealth answer when you cry out? Your books, your music, your laptop, your mobile phone, your painting, your fame, your fashion, your love of new clothes. Now I'm not asking do those things exist or do they give pleasure. I'm asking something deeper than that. Can they return your love? Can they care for you? Can they tell you how much they love you? How much you matter to them? Can they plead for you? What about the judgment? Will you spend eternity in their embrace? Or aren't they made of fabric or steel or paper or bricks and mortar or plastic or wood or covered with paint? And here you are tonight, a never-dying soul. Someone who longs and aches and you are not going to find rest in material things. In things that will not last. The things that, that don't really answer the need of the human heart. So we hear tonight from a saviour, a saviour who was crucified and resurrected and taken to glory. And a saviour who says to you and me tonight, all who labour, all who are heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Your motor car can't say to you, come to me and I will give you rest. A bottle of alcohol can't say to you, come to me and I will give you rest. It may dull your conscience and knock you out for a while, but tomorrow the hangover tells you it's not the real answer. Football can't say to you, come to me and I will give you rest. Money can't say to you, come to me and I will give you rest. But you can hear the the Lord Jesus Christ saying tonight, come to me, come to me. And I will give you rest, eternal rest. Lasting rest. Salvation rest. We need a saviour like that. Who speaks to us. Come to me, he says. And will answer us when we call on him. A saviour we can personally know. That when we cry out to Jesus, there's a a heart in a saviour who his heart beats in grace and mercy and compassion. A saviour who tells us that there's joy in the presence of God when a sinner turns to him in repentance and faith. So you need to ask these questions. Will the things you hunger after last? Will the things you hunger after answer when you call on them? Will the things you hunger after save your soul? You're not just a body, you see. You're also soul. 
And so the Lord Jesus Christ asks this question. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? You can gain the whole world and lose your soul. And Jesus says that would be a bad bargain. Imagine achieving everything that the hobby has to offer. You've got it all. You've traced your family tree back to Adam. You've got every work of art you wanted. Every stamp you wanted. Every penny black. You've got everybody's autograph from William Shakespeare to Princess Diana. You've got the world's largest diamond. You've got everything your hobby could desire. Everything you've hungered for. You've got it all, but you've lost your soul. It's a bad bargain, says Jesus. It's a disaster. When you've got every fascination in the world. But remember, you've also a soul. A never-dying soul. And you need a saviour, and I need a saviour, who will meet the need of the soul. You see, it's not just that you have a soul. Jesus says, without him you have a lost soul. What is that lostness? It is our guilt. Because in our lives we've sinned. We've incurred guilt before God, wrath before God, condemnation before God. That's the biggest, most urgent need. You can look at all the options, says Jesus. All the options that this world has to offer, it's temporary passing pleasures, but you, you can't take them to the throne of judgment. At the judgment, when you say, Lord, I really enjoyed myself in the world. I had a complete record of my family tree. I had garage after garage full of restored classic cars. I had the, the greatest work of art ever to be painted in the world. But what about forgiveness of sin? What about atonement for sin? None of those things will stand on the day of judgment. So when you ask, will the things you hunger after last? Will the things you hunger after answer when you call on them? Will the things you hunger after save your soul? I say, nothing in this world will answer those questions. Nothing in this world will answer the deepest cry of your heart. Nothing in this world will save your soul. So what are we going to hunger after? We live in a society that says the best thing to do is hunger for experience. Everywhere I hear it these days, experience, experience, experience. Pleasure, 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 whatever it is. Hunger and thirst for that. You'll be fine. Augustine famously said, Lord, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So our generation that hungers after this and that and the other thing. And his desperate search indicates that failure to meet anything in this world that fills the God-shaped vacuum in the human heart. So unsatisfied hunger. Will the things you hunger after last? Will the things you hunger after answer when you call on them? Will the things you hunger after save your soul? Nothing in this world will do that, says Jesus. And he emphasizes it in verse 25. Luke 6 verse 21. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. But woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. So let's think about satisfied hunger. Unsatisfied hunger. But what about satisfied hunger? Jesus is saying, let's all be hungry people. Let everyone in London be hungry. But let's be hungry to be right with God. To know God. To know a saviour, Jesus Christ, and grow and be changed, be made more like him. Are you hungry to know Jesus who speaks to us in his word and by the Holy Spirit? Are you hungry for a righteousness from God, which is by faith unto all and upon all who believe in Jesus Christ? Are you hungry for the righteousness of Christ imputed to you by faith? Are you hungry for Jesus Christ who has made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? Are you hungry to have the robes of Christ covering you? 
Are you hungry to know all your sins forgiven? Are you hungry to grow as a Christian? I was reading in this last week. It really challenged me to think about who Jesus that mighty saviour is. When he emptied himself and came into this world and took a true human nature, left the glories of heaven, and in the incarnation took to himself a, a true human nature, was born as a child and baby in Bethlehem. Not two persons with two natures. Not one person with one nature. But Jesus, the writer said, and this took more power, the power of God is more wonderfully displayed here than even at the creation of the universe, that Jesus Christ was one person with two natures, fully God, fully man in one person. You can have a lifetime hungering to know that Jesus more and more. The greatness, the majesty, the wonder, the glory, the delight. The inevitable greatness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became man. If you're freely justified by God's grace through Jesus Christ, it's a glorious thing to be hungry for Jesus. Hungry for grace. Hungry for mercy and forgiveness and to know more of Jesus. How are you hungry to know more about Jesus, would I know? More of his gracious fullness, no. More of his love for a sinner like me. He's the one I'm hungering after. Nothing less can satisfy it. But nothing more is desired. Let's hunger for Jesus, I'm saying. Let's be filled by him. Let's be those who hunger for Jesus and to know his love and peace and grace and worship him. And then hunger, him, hunger after him every day, seeking him through his word by the Holy Spirit. Jesus feeding us daily bread like manna from heaven. So we, we worship this saviour tonight who says, Blessed are you who hunger, for you shall be filled. It's hard to, almost to, to believe it. That this is why the Son of God came into this world. To feed that hunger that's in the human heart. That's why he was sent by God his Father, the mighty creator. He came to save us from our sin and all its effects in our lives. Because we all know without Christ that sense of guilt and regret and shame that men and women carry around with them. We see them trying to escape from it in drink and drugs and those Nitrous oxide, laughing gas, little canisters I was telling you about. But these words of Jesus Christ go down to the root of things. We look around at people around. And we see in our society, people don't hunger for Jesus. They don't long for the vindication of God's name. That isn't important to them. The misuse of God's name doesn't grieve them. We hear it all the time now on the TV. It's hard to go to any program on the TV now. You have to keep switching it off. Because for our society, if the truth is told, people prefer that the Almighty God will keep his distance. Keep out. Keep away. Not intrude too much on their freedom to do whatever they like. So what Jesus did on the cross is not important to them. Who he is, one person with two natures, not important. They're not hungry. To grow in grace, to be more pure, more loving, more faithful, more honest, more love for God, more love for Jesus. In fact, unbelievers find it very difficult to wrap their minds around these beatitudes and these woes of the Saviour. Find it very hard to understand. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Because you're a completely different foundation for life. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that great man from Russia, gave a Harvard commencement address back now in 1978. It's hard to believe it was so long ago. Because it was a very revealing moment in Western culture. In those days, the great Russian novelist, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, 
He was everyone's hero in the West. This great man who had suffered for his convictions in the Soviet gulag. A brilliant writer. His writings changed the world, we could say. Had something to do with the uh, delegitimization of communism that led to the collapse and the collapse of the Iron Curtain. No one exposed that nation's inhumanity as powerfully and as irrefutably as Solzhenitsyn had. So Harvard sought him out as their commencement speaker to give a Harvard address. And he said that the Western world was the very world that the Lord Jesus Christ describes in these four woes. Rich, comfortable, pleasure-seeking, self-congratulatory. And he said, the Western world is wrong if it thinks it can find satisfaction in materialism. Because there is no satisfaction without reference to God. No satisfaction, he said, without reference to God. Now, you might have think, thought this great man, everyone would have politely nodded their heads. After all, don't we all believe that money can't buy me love? That people are more important than things? And that it's better to be good than to be rich? But Solzhenitsyn's speech provoked howls of protest. Protest from all quarters of the Western world. Because as many people noticed at the time, Solzhenitsyn had struck very close to home. We liked him when he talked about the sins of the Soviet Union. But now we talked about the idols of the West. And he warned people living in a materialistic culture that they were leaning on a broken reed. No satisfaction without God, he said. And his days as a hero in the West were over. In a single sunny morning in Boston. When Solzhenitsyn declared, no satisfaction without God. Away with him, said the culture. Away with him. And the Lord Jesus Christ suffered a similar fate. So people have a love of something else, if it's a love of money or whatever it is, they strike back when their idol is exposed and attacked. So what may seem familiar to you tonight if you're a Christian is something that many people do not want to hear. You go to work tomorrow morning and your colleague says to you, what did you, what did you do on the weekend? And you say, oh, I heard someone say, woe to us if we are full, for we shall hunger. Boy, you'll have, you'll have put a stick into a hornet's nest. Because people don't want to hear that they must become followers of Jesus Christ to be truly blessed. That a life of true blessedness must be in some important spiritual aspects, poor and hungry and at complete odds with prevailing culture. But has anything happened in the last 2,000 years from when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke these words to prove that Jesus was wrong? The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the demonstration of the absolute truth of this beatitude and this woe. Life is short. It is followed by an eternity that is very long, everlasting. Anyone who lives without regard, regard to that fact, without an honest reckoning of what comes after death, will face an infinite woe, says Jesus. Something that is not worth facing to enjoy the pleasures of a passing world to an extent that you can enjoy them without Jesus. So the hungry man, the hungry woman, turns to God and cries out in the words of Psalm 107. O 
O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered, he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. The city of God. The city that will stand when all the rest of creation crumbles. So there is coming a day when God will forever satisfy hungry people. And they will never be hungry again. And that promise focuses on a kingdom of God. There will be a great banquet feast. When all of God's children will feast with delight and never be, never be hungry again. And we have a little foretaste of that even now. Because the men and women of grace have found glory begun below. And that celestial fruit on earthly ground from faith and hope may grow. So it's only Jesus can really meet that deep longing of the human heart. The sinner may know that he or she is hungry. But there's a hunger for truth that is found only in Jesus Christ and forgiveness. The hungry sinner takes Jesus Christ as the prophet, priest and king. And then is satisfied. That's the way to true blessedness, says Jesus. So in this contrast, again, the Lord Jesus turns the culture and the expectations of men and women upside down. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be filled. But woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Those who hunger for him see their need of a saviour and are satisfied. Those who are full themselves and say, we have need of nothing, will be eternally miserable. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be filled. But woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Let's come to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you tonight for the soul hunger that you create by the work of your Holy Spirit. And through your word points us tonight to Jesus Christ, the only one who can truly meet that hunger of the human heart. The hunger to know God, to be right with God, to have sins forgiven. Oh Lord, we thank you for that Saviour, Jesus Christ, who meets with us and grants us such spiritual satisfaction. What a treasure we find in Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, all sufficient. Beyond telling is your worth. In your name lie greater treasures than the richest found on earth. Such abundance. Such abundance is my portion with my God. O oh Lord, may we delight to know you, satisfying that hunger of the soul. Hear us tonight, Lord. Meet with us by your word and spirit. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.